Welcome to another movie plot. It begins with a large military ship traversing deep space on its trip back to Earth. The sleeping crew are unaware of an alien stowaway that starts a fire and begins the ship's automated evacuation. The computer places the cryotubes into an escape pod and ejects it at the nearest planet. It's home to an abandoned mining facility owned by the Wayland yutani Corporation and is currently populated by a group of criminals deemed too dangerous to remain on Earth. The evacuation vehicle crash lands in the ocean and is found by a Dr. Clemens from the shoreline. As the inmates extract the vehicle they discover all the passengers have died, except for one who Clemens finds washed up on the beach named Ripley. After performing CPR she starts breathing again and is taken to the facility's medical bay, while the warden Andrews walks among the prisoners and warns them about the temptation of the woman. The New Age Christian fundamentalists listen to a prayer read by their spiritual leader Dylan, then are reminded by inmate Morse that their vow of celibacy also includes women. Despite this the more conscionable still worry for Ripley's safety amongst the more unstable prisoners. She's left in the care of Dr. Clemens until the company rescue ship arrives which won't be for a few days. When she wakes up from hypersleep the lone survivor is distraught to learn that her entire group of companions died in the crash. She gets dressed and Clemens takes Ripley for a walk through the facility, where she learns that only 25 people remain on the planet to keep the furnaces warm until Jesus returns. At the salvaged vessel Ripley hears that her corporal was impaled while their robotic science officer was destroyed, and her adopted daughter Newt drowned in her sleep without feeling anything. Before she can process things Ripley sees an acid burn and immediately suspects it's the result of alien blood. She demands to see Newt's body and has Clemens perform an autopsy to confirm that she wasn't impregnated by the creature. There's no signs of anything unusual when the warden and his dim-witted assistant Mr. Aaron enter. Although mortified at the sight, Andrews is more concerned about keeping Ripley confined to the infirmary to prevent the horny criminals from lashing out. They decide to use the facility blast furnace to cremate the bodies and remove any possible diseases. While they recite biblical passages two inmates drag an ox carcass into the kitchen to be slaughtered, and on their way to join the funeral notice the alien that brought down the ship lying dead by the ox. They don't realize that it's already impregnated babe, and unseen by anyone a chestburster emerges on all fours and scurries off into the maze-like compound. After the funeral Ripley shaves her head and showers as a metaphorical new beginning. She enters the mess hall and attempts to thank Dylan for his eulogy but he's one of the few against her being with the general population. Nevertheless he says that they'll tolerate her, and after dinner Ripley's asked about the autopsy by Clemens but she doesn't want to mention the alien and they go to bed instead. Elsewhere a prisoner finds a shed skin and hears movement coming from inside one of the smaller pipes. He checks it out to find the alien finishing its metamorphosis into an adult, then it spits acid in his face sending the inmate tumbling backwards into a giant fan. When Clemens wakes up he ignores Ripley's questions about what got him sent there and goes to investigate the dead inmate. They conclude that he was just too distracted by the presence of a woman and fell into the fan, however Clemens becomes suspicious when he finds an acid burn left by the alien. He finds Ripley rummaging through the wreckage and informs her but she needs to recover the flight recorder to find evidence of what brought down their ship. When she's left alone Ripley finds the remains of her team's android, but as she tries to leave a group of inmates led by Junior attack her. Before they can do anything Dylan shows up and beats one of the men to death, then tells Ripley to leave so he can re-educate his other brothers on celibacy. Meanwhile three inmates are in the tunnels lighting candles, when one comes across the fully grown alien xenomorph that instantly kills him. His friends come to investigate, when a second is suddenly snatched from above spraying the already mentally unstable gullet with blood. The only survivor flees at the sight of it and is found soon after sitting in the mess hall in shock, but is presumed by everyone to have killed them. Ripley reactivates what's left of the android bishop to have him confirm that it was in fact an alien that caused the crash. Then after he's finished transmitting everything back to Earth Ripley permanently pulls her silicon friend's plug. She goes to the infirmary where they have Golik held and is ranting about a dragon that killed his friends. Dylan believes the religious angle while Ripley tells them about the alien and how it killed her crew, but Andrew doesn't believe either and locks Ripley up along with Golik until the rescue team arrives. Still refusing to recount her story to the doctor as to not sound crazy, Clemens reveals that his morphine addiction is what got him sent there when he accidentally caused 11 people's deaths. He was a promising young doctor who no one would employ so he remained at the prison with his motley crew of friends. Suddenly Golik notices it first, as the Xeno enters the infirmary and immediately kills Clemens with its piston-like throat. It corners Ripley against a wall, but after inspection decides to let her live and retreats with its kill into the ventilation shaft. Golik sits amazed while Ripley runs back to the mess hall where Dylan's saying another prayer. Andrews is putting together a search party to find the missing inmates when Ripley enters raving about an alien, so the warden orders her to be taken away but is suddenly grabbed from a vent above him and torn apart in front of the doubters. Things go quiet over the next few hours as the terrified inmates try to come up with a plan. 
Aaron feels he's the best replacement for a leader, but Morse calls him 85 because of his publicly known IQ and nobody else takes him seriously. Despite Morse blaming Ripley for bringing the alien and with Dylan's denial of leadership, Ripley becomes the unofficial leader of the group and they begin to come up with a plan. Unlike the ones previously known to Ripley, this alien moves on all fours like the beast that it spawned from and not anthropomorphic like a human. Aaron shows Ripley a containment unit that they hope to lure this dumber variant inside of. Inmate David shows her the highly flammable barrels of toxic waste being stored, and they all start mopping the tunnels with the fuel in hopes of scaring the alien. Suddenly it attacks one man causing him to drop his cigar and the entire plan's ruined, as the tunnels are preemptively consumed by flames and their numbers are drastically reduced. Junior and another man who attack Ripley are injured but she still helps them until Dylan shows up to assist. He orders Junior to go to the other side of the tunnel and turn on the sprinklers, when the xenomorph descends and corners the main group in a dead end. To save his friends Junior's able to taunt the dragon into chasing him into the chamber, where the rest of the group seal them both inside and hear their comrade torn apart through the door. With the mission a success the survivors extinguish the fires collect their dead and somberly return to the prison. Aaron contacts the company and informs Ripley that both she and the alien are their top priority though they didn't say why. Ripley's clearance with Wayland yutani allows her to see more information than the local, and she learns that the team being sent has the intention of studying the alien not terminating it. In the meantime Golik convinces Morse to let him out of his restraint since he's declared innocent, but he knocks Morse out and goes to the containment chamber where the stoic Arthur stands guard. He suddenly slashes Arthur's throat while apologizing and releases the xenomorph which he's come to worship. He asks the alien what it wants him to do next but it just kills him and takes off running. During this time Ripley warns Dylan about the company's treachery, but he doesn't care and says that the rest of humanity is dead to him and his brothers anyway. They're interrupted by Morse with the info that both Arthur and Golik are dead and the Xeno escaped. As the group bicker about having to wait another 10 hours for the rescue team to arrive, Ripley feels strange and returns to her shuttle's medical bay where she's assisted by Aaron in taking scans. They discover that she's carrying the embryo of an alien queen capable of laying eggs. Despite this Aaron refuses to warn the company to stay away from the planet, as he's still under the belief that they're going to rescue them and wants to return to his wife and child. Ripley knows they just want the specimen and will probably kill everyone else just for seeing it, so she goes hunting it herself hoping that it won't harm someone pregnant with a queen. Meanwhile Dylan's gathered the inmates and is trying to decide what to do next. Since they have no weapons the group come up with the idea to relocate to the furnace where the fires will hopefully keep the alien away. It's now Ripley locates the alien and spears it but she's just been fooled by the bend in a pipe. The real xenomorph then makes itself known as it slithers down from the ceiling cornering Ripley in the basement. She returns unharmed to Dylan as her theory was correct and asks him to kill her to prevent a queen from being born. He's come to believe everything she tells him and agrees, but strikes the cell next to her head and tells her to kill herself as they've bigger things to worry about. So Ripley reserves to defeating the alien first, after which Dylan says he'll be happy to give her a quick and painless death. They go to the furnace where Aaron's still under the impression that his superiors won't just kill him and wants to wait it out. Ripley explains that her original crew and even the marines sent after them were all deemed expendable and this group's no different. Dylan rallies the troops that fighting back against the dragon may be their way into heaven, and that it's better to go down fighting than to sit there waiting to be killed. Not being the religious type, Aaron refuses to follow the plan while the rest of them attempt to lure the alien into the furnace and drown it in hot metal. The prisoners act as bait running around the confusing halls closing doors behind them and trying to trap the Xeno on top of a giant mold. A few of the inmates are sacrificed to direct the creature into the chamber and some men even begin questioning their fate. David bonks the xenomorph with a flare and successfully traps it inside, but it doubles back out of the room and kills him from behind. Thinking that the alien's about to step onto the mold, an inmate activates the furnace in a panic giving them only a 5 minute countdown. One makes a valiant attempt to lower it back but is mercilessly grabbed just before he enters the chamber. Morse collides with another inmate rounding a corner and they laugh it off, when the alien swiftly kills one but Ripley's there to save the other's day. She holds off the alien until Morse can escape and Dylan arrives to pull her back to safety. The Xeno follows them into the chamber but is sealed inside on top of the mold when Morse shuts the final door. Ripley makes it out but Dylan decides to remain inside and sacrifice himself, distracting the alien long enough for Morse to activate the smelter submerging them both in the liquid hot metal. Before they can celebrate the alien leaps out of the lead with no intention of showing Ripley any more mercy. It chases her up the structure but she activates the sprinkler system, causing the metal to harden and the alien to completely explode. Meanwhile the company ship finally arrives at the planet and Aaron's met at the entrance by a team of scientists. As the only two survivors begin to exit they're confronted by the company scientists and armed soldiers who are all led by Bishop. 
He calmly tells her that he's been sent to show her the level of trust the company has in her and to prove they want to help. He designed the androids after himself and says that the creature inside her can't be allowed to live. But Ripley's learned to assume the worst from the company and makes preparations to kill herself. A soldier shoots Morse but Bishop stops him revealing his level of protection for the xenomorph. In response Aaron hits Bishop with a lead pipe causing his ear to detach, but his one act of bravery in the whole movie gets him fatally shot by one of the soldiers. The scientist begs Ripley not to ruin their chances to study the magnificent specimen, but Ripley steps backwards into the furnace destroying both herself and the alien queen. Once again Whale and Utami leave this one empty-handed, apart from taking whatever equipment they can salvage and Morse who they probably execute after questioning. And the movie ends.